Let me read to you a passage from the sixth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 7 to 15. It's the Gospel for Tuesday of the first week of Lent. St. Matthew writes, Jesus said to his disciples, When you are praying, do not babble on and on, as do the pagans. For they think that in using an abundance of words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. In this way ought you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive those indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their failings, your heavenly Father will forgive you yours also. But if you do not forgive them, neither will your Father forgive you yours. That's from Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 to 15. And what does it suggest to us? Well, it has often been observed that while rationality and the power of choice are distinctive of human nature, religion is distinctive of human history and culture. Consult any really good historian of virtually any of the cultures of the world, with the exception, of course, of the anomaly of our own modern Western culture and those cultures affected by Western secularism, and the verdict will be that religion is unavoidable. It's everywhere. The Romans regarded themselves as religious and persecuted the Christians because they denied fundamental pillars of their religion. What indigenous people has not had its religion? A religion which almost invariably pervades its culture. It looks as if from the evidence that man was meant by the Creator to turn to Him. The problem is that in respect to God, as is obvious from the profoundly conflicting images and views of God, well, man has lost his way. Of himself, as we might put it, he, does not how, he doesn't know how to do it. Now, if there is anything characteristic of religion, it is prayer. So fundamental to religion is prayer that the two terms are almost interchangeable. St. Alphonsus Liguri wrote in one of his many books that a person who does not pray will not be saved. The obvious question is then, not whether we should pray, but how we should pray, because the quality and degree of our religion will depend on how we pray. To take an obvious example from one of our Lord's own parables, how great was the difference between how the Pharisee in the temple prayed in that parable and how the publican standing well behind him prayed. The Pharisee went home after his prayer, not right with God, still separated from him, while the publican went home right with God. Indeed, the Pharisee had hardly prayed at all. Our Lord referred to him as praying to himself. How to pray? We need a teacher, and that teacher is Christ. Our Gospel today contains the model of prayer that he gave to his disciples, preceded and followed by some of his teaching on prayer. Let's consider that teaching that he gave prior to and following on the prayer that he taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer. He says, When you are praying, do not babble on and on as do the pagans, for they think 
that in using an abundance of words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So our prayer ought to be offered in the presence of the one we know to be our Father. He loves us. He is almighty. And He knows what we need before we ask Him. So then, we ought to begin our prayer placing ourselves firmly in the presence of our great Father who we know loves us. You know, St. Teresa of Avila, a doctor of the Church precisely on prayer, defined prayer in those very terms that I gave. Prayer, she, she writes, is an intimate conversation with the one who we know loves us. He understands us through and through. If we are filled with the thought of God being our Father, our prayer will be simple. Let us think again of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, and notice how verbose was the Pharisee's prayer in contrast to the simplicity and brevity of the prayer of the publican. The publican's prayer was truly sublime, and it involved repeating over and over again, O oh God, be merciful to me a sinner. Cardinal Newman in the 19th century once wrote in a sermon that it expressed the essence of true religion, that prayer of the publican. Really, it was a variant of the petition in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts. And when we think of that petition in the Lord's Prayer, let us think of the prayer of the publican. Now, in respect to this simple prayer for mercy, this petition for forgiveness, let us meditate on what our Lord adds to it. He adds, forgive us our debts as we also forgive those indebted to us. If we wish to be forgiven our failings, our offences, we must forgive others their failings, their offences also. Who could imagine the publican of our Lord's parable failing to forgive others their offences against him? He was too contrite and too desirous of God's forgiveness to do otherwise. Our Lord's conclusion is clear and ominous. If you forgive others their offences, your heavenly Father will forgive you yours also. But if you do not forgive them, neither will your Father forgive you yours. In his instruction, both preceding and following the prayer he taught his disciples, our Lord has given us all a great spiritual work, full of promise and full of consequences. The Lord's Prayer offers food and guidance for a whole lifetime. The Church, in her teaching on prayer down through the centuries, comments on the Lord's Prayer in her catechisms and makes it the basis of everything. Let us ponder on the instruction given by our Lord prior to and following that prayer He taught His disciples in the version of today provided by St. Matthew. Let us realize that we are speaking to God our Father who knows us far more than we know, we know ourselves. And let us not fail to forgive from the heart all those who have offended us.